All right, this morning we are looking at uh, expositional preaching. What is that? <laughs> we'll find out very shortly. Uh, this is part of the Landmarks of a Healthy Church series, which is a book you can purchase. I have the digital copy at home on my computer. Um, and so last week we did an introduction, and now we're looking at the first uh, mark of a healthy church, which is expositional preaching. And I want to read from uh, Acts 20, 17 to 30. There are many passages of Scripture that I've kind of chosen, and this one I chose it for, in particular for one verse. Uh, but I will read it, and then we'll uh, look at it a bit later on, uh, maybe toward the end, and then we'll uh, say a few, uh, few words about that. <clears throat> So Acts 20, verse 17 to 30, the context here is that after many years of Paul uh, uh, doing church planting in the uh, Asia Minor and also in Greece, uh, now here he is in Ephesus and he's leaving for Jerusalem where he'll, he'll be tried. And so here is his departure uh, from Ephesus and meeting with the uh, leaders of the church. And so reading from verse 17, it says, Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus, and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, sorry, humility, and with tears and with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that chains and afflictions await me. But I do not make my life any account nor dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of grace of God. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching of the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. Verse 27. Uh, For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. <clears throat> I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. And from among you, uh, your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. May God bless his word to us. This is the living word of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for our time together again. As we uh, look into your word, we desire to know uh, all that the scripture teaches and exhorts us and commands us to do. And Lord, we pray that as we look into your word, that your spirit would be our guide and our teacher. Uh, for we know your spirit is the one who wrote the scriptures. So now, Lord, we thank you for this time that we have as we look into this uh, very important topic of uh, expository preaching. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us, uh, edify us, and uh, bring uh, people to saving faith as well. We pray these things in the mighty name of Christ. Amen. Amen. So today we look at the first mark of a healthy church, as outlined in the book by Mark Dever, uh, which is called Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. And the topic is expositional preaching, expositional preaching. There are so many different area, uh, ideas out there about what constitutes a healthy church. What is a healthy church, people will ask. Uh, and what is not a healthy church? People will say a healthy church, well, you see great numbers. Uh, the, the, the church is growing by leaps and bounds. Or many conversions, that's a sign of a healthy church. Well, it may be. Um, a church filled with activities or programs. Is that a healthy church? A church that has a TV ministry, or a lot of money is coming in, into the church. Well, that's a healthy church. Well, these are things are, are good in themselves, but uh, are these what constitutes a healthy church? Well, it seems that every Christian, or just about, has his or her uh, own ideas about what a church should be like and what makes a healthy church. 
Well, this series is going to uh, challenge all of us. It's going to challenge me and help me to raise the bar, hopefully, and hopefully help us all to look at ourselves individually and also corporately as a church body. And with humility, with God's grace, we will make the necessary changes. May God help us as we continue in the series to make the necessary changes so that our church can be healthier, so that our church can resemble more like what uh, uh, the, like the churches of the apostles first established. Uh, we know that even after the days of the Apostle Paul, the days of the apostles, there were a lot of churches that had all kinds of problems, right? I think the reasons why Paul wrote those letters is because there were some problems in the churches. So if we think that we have no problems in our church, well, we have a problem <laughs> with that. <clears throat> so therefore, the first mark of the book is, uh, in the book is expositional preaching. What is that? What is that about? Well, the word expositional comes from the verb to exposit. It's a term that we don't use uh, every day. But to, to exposit means to expound, to expound or to demonstrate clearly the text of Scripture. That is taking the Scriptures and saying and, and analyze it carefully and study it carefully and it's to say what it says. Not what I want it to say, but what it says. There's another term, um, uh, I'm going to ask you the question, have you ever heard of this term before, exegesis? Some of you have heard this term. When I was in seminary, my first year of seminary back years ago, uh, the teachers were saying exegesis, exegesis, and I thought, what are they saying about Jesus? <laughs> and I really didn't know what, what it meant. And then, But basically it's a word that comes from the Greek, uh, I forget what the Greek word is, but it's, it's similar to that. Exegesis means simply to draw from the text what is there. <clears throat> it's a discipline. It takes time to really learn what, uh, to learn how to study the text and to draw from the text what it says. The opposite of that is eisegesis, which basically means to read into the text your own ideas, your own views. And all of us, we've done that. You know, we've had, maybe grew up in the church, we thought, okay, well, this is always what was said about this verse. And so we read into the text what it says, and then, uh, what, 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 rather what we want, uh, and then we realize afterwards, no, that's not what it meant. <laughs> that's not what the text means. So exegesis means drawing the meaning out of. And eisegesis means reading meaning into the text. Don't worry, I'm not going to test you on these things afterwards. I'm just mentioning these things for the sake of, uh, of our study. Exegesis is the process of speaking, of seeking to understand what a text means or communicates on its own. In other words, looking at the verse, what does it say in it on its own, by itself, at face value, black and white, what does it say? Eisegesis is the opposite, which is a generally a derogatory term used to designate the practice of imposing a preconceived or foreign meaning onto a text, even if that meaning could not have been originally intended at the time of its writing. So we've all done that. And I, I remember uh, having an understanding of, of a verse of scripture when I was a younger Christian, and then some years later realizing, oh, I, I had the wrong understanding of the verse. So it takes discipline to read the, the text accurately and properly. And if you have uh, uh, training in Greek or Hebrew, that gives you uh, uh, an added uh, advantage because you are able to look at the original languages and you're able to see the nuances of the terms uh, and of the words and so forth. So what's the opposite of expository preaching? And you know that largely in our church we preach by exposition. I preach through the Gospel of John. I preach through um, many different books of the scriptures. We have just finished a series on the, on the Gospel of Matthew. And after this series, I'm not sure exactly where I'm going to go. I have a few ideas. But uh, it's, it's important to preach through a text of Scripture because that's where we leave no stone unturned. So the opposite of expository preaching is topical preaching, which is what I'm doing this morning, <laughs> uh, which seems contradictory <laughs> to, to my commitment to preach by exposition. But topical preaching, there's a place for that. There's a place and time for that. I was thinking about this this morning. What's an example of that? Well, let's say 9-11 occurred, right? The planes uh, attacked the, the, the Twin Towers. Uh, the first Sunday after that, what do we do? We ignore the issue? Everybody has questions. What, what, is, what do we say? How are we to think about this? So there's a place in time for these issues. 
I'm sure when uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked back uh, uh, 60 years ago, 60 years ago, that many churches they, they see the opportunity to say, hey, <laughs> you know, uh, let's trust God. Uh, these things. Um, are part of a fallen world, and so forth. So there's a place for topical preaching. But the preferred way to preach is by exposition, word for word, verse by verse. Now when I say verse by verse, we all accept that, but sometimes word for word, sometimes we have to look at the word itself. Is, is the verb in the past, present, or future? Is it passive? Is it active? And so on and so forth. These are very important to help us understand uh, what the text, what the words, uh, uh, what, what is the meaning, what is the original intended meaning uh, by God. <clears throat> so word for word, verse by verse, book by book, because this way the reader, the teacher, the preacher has no option but to search out every portion of scripture, leaving no stone unturned, which helps us to understand again the original intended meaning of all of God's words. And that's our purpose. We read the scriptures. It's not an outdated book. People think of the Bible, ah, it's just 2,000 years old or more. No, it's not outdated. It is the most updated book. It is applicable for every person on the face of the earth for all times. And sadly, many Christians approach the scriptures with the idea that the word uh, just contains truths uh, that are largely disconnected. Uh, and it's up to you to put them together. Uh, therefore, you can pick, uh, in, that, in that mindset, you can pick any topic, find a text that, you, uh, that fits or loosely fits your topic, uh, ignore the context, and, uh, and then wow people with your creative imagination. And people will respond and say, well, wow, I never saw that before. That's because it, wasn't never, it was never there before. <laughs> uh, so we have to be careful uh, when, uh, when, especially when uh, people are sp specific, specifically focusing on topical sermons all the time, uh, the, when they pick a, a portion of scripture, is it in context? Thus, the proper approach is expository study, teaching, and preaching. And there are many passages that, uh, that I want to look at here that really uh, uh, underscores and uh, elevates the scriptures to its rightful place. And, uh, so we're going to look at these uh, verses right now. Hebrews 4.12, uh, a passage that you should be familiar with. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active, and it is. The word of God is the most powerful thing on the face of the earth. Sharper than any two-edged sword. You know what a sword does? Well, the word of God is sharper than that. Piercing, it says here. The Word of God is able to pierce the division of soul and spirit. That's an expression that basically means it can penetrate our inner being like nothing else can. It says here, uh, um, piercing uh, of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Only the Word of God has that power. It was the Word of God that God used in my teen teenage years, late teenage, teenage years, when I was picking up the gospel tracts on the streets and uh, it was the Word of God in those tracts that was speaking to me, and I was transformed. It led me to that, that time, that evening, when I surrendered my life over to Christ. And so the Word of God is quick and powerful. Don't hesitate to leave it anywhere and everywhere to share the Word of God itself to anyone. 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture. Does that mean all? All. Genesis to Revelation. All Scripture is, here in the ESV says, breathed out by God, which is a more accurate translation. Inspired is, there's some truth in that for sure, but inspired can be, you know, first as well, I, I'm a poet, I'm inspired to write this poem. Well, it's not like the, uh, the authors were inspired in that way, uh, or, uh, or, or from God, but it says here, breathed out by God. God breathed it out, and keep that in mind, the word breathe, uh, we'll look at that a bit later on, breathed out by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So the word of God was written by the Holy Spirit, as we'll see also in another passage, <clears throat> we'll turn to that right now, 2 Peter 1, 19-21, it says here, uh, Peter writes, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. What is he saying by the prophetic word? Let's talk about the scriptures. This is the prophetic word. 
<clears throat> that he's referring to. Because we see in the context, that's exactly what he's referring to. We have the prophetic word more carefully confirmed, to which you do well to pay attention to, to pay attention as to a lamp sh shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, <clears throat> that no prophecy of Scripture, that is nothing that we see in Scripture, is from someone's own interpretation. It wasn't, wasn't like the Apostle Paul or Peter or John thought, oh, I feel inspired to write something. No, it wasn't from them. Rather, he explains here, uh, verse 21, for no prophecy of Scripture, nothing written in Scripture, nothing here in our hands, was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the one who breathed upon the uh, apostles, the prophets of the Old Testament, and so forth, and that's why they wrote. So the author of the scriptures is the Holy Spirit. That's why what we have in our hands. Every word, every little word, uh, the articles, uh, pronouns, uh, and uh, objects of, of the sentence, all inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we have to be careful to read every word and interpret every word uh, that is uh, what we're called upon to do. So that's another passage that, uh, that supports the uh, truth that the scriptures is what we are to study. Uh, furthermore, uh, in Luke 21, 33, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away. So he promises heaven and earth will pass away. It will happen uh, when he returns, but my words will not pass away. Imagine that. Everything he says will never pass away. Will never Never means never means never never at any point in time, uh, past, present, or future. His words, the word of God, is that which is the rock, and I and I and I uh, tie that in with the words of, of uh, Jesus to Peter, where he says, "I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church." The rock is the word of God. Primarily, that is that is what that verse is referring to. Uh, furthermore, in Matthew five eighteen, uh, Jesus says, "For truly I say to you." Until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota or dot. That is the smallest stroke of the pen in Aramaic or Hebrew, this is what Christ is referring to, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And he's saying that every little stroke of the pen is inspired or breathed out by God himself and will never pass away. Uh, finally, in uh, Mark 4.4, 4, when Christ was tempted, the first temptation, Jesus responded to Satan, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And that's why the word of God uh, is central. It is front and center. I have I've never had any doubts about the authority of Scripture. <clears throat> Even before I was saved, I remember picking up gospel tracts and reading those, those verses in the tracts and comparing it with my Bible that I had. And I had no doubt it was the Spirit of God who was affirming to me that this was indeed the living Word of God. And we need to approach the Word of God with awe and reverence and with fear. It is the living Word of God, not some sort of outdated book that can be thrown into trash. No, friends, it is the most precious thing that I have in the face of the earth. Of course, you can say my salvation is the most precious thing. But next to that is the Word of God. They can take everything from me, but I... I hope I will have the Word of God with me forever. So when we look at the Word of God, we ought to approach it in this manner. Uh, that not one word from Genesis to Revelation, from beginning to end, was spoken unnecessarily, nor was, it, was any of it a slip of the tongue. And I was thinking about, you know, if a politician's, politician is um, uh, speaking publicly, you know, he has a prepared speech, and there it is on a teleprompter, right? That way he reads what's on the teleprompter, that way he doesn't get into trouble. And then so afterwards, if he's finished with his script, with the, with the speech, uh, then the reporters are sort of asking him questions, and some, sometimes some very um, pointed questions. Sometimes he or she may, the politician may go off script, and that's when they get into trouble. <laughs> or oftentimes get into trouble. So but the Word of God is not like that at all. The Word of God is not a book where, oh, God slipped up, or he, uh, he shouldn't have said that. No, everything, every single word, even the, uh, the chron chrono uh, chronologies, 
you know, the, the long list of names <laughs> we find in many places. Even those words, or those, those names and everything was put there by, by the Word of God and by God the Holy Spirit. So then the Word of God is His perfect speech from His mouth, even as it is spoken through the Old Testament prophets, even as it is spoken through the, the mouth of Christ, and also through the mouth of the apostles and written down for us. All of it is God's holy word. This is why God's word is always fresh. It's always fresh, always alive, always relevant, always up to date, and never outdated. It is always powerful. You know, you notice in your Bible, there's no expiry date on it. You know, <laughs> there's no expiry date. It's, it's relevant for every person on the face of the earth because again it is the living word of God it is the only book that God has given humanity where God says here I am this is who I am and uh, by reading the word you will know who God is so we are to approach the scriptures with holy awe with fear with reverence for it is God it is God who is literally speaking to us. He is. And so as I mentioned earlier, this is a great irony in all of this, for that in order to preach about expository preaching, I have to contradict myself by preaching topically about expository preaching. But again, there's a place and time for that. So let's go into our text here this morning in, in Acts 20. I just want to go over it uh, some parts very quickly. Um, and I want to focus on verse 27, which is on the screen there. So again, Paul was leaving uh, uh, Miletus. Uh, he called the, uh, the elders of uh, Ephesus to come to join him. And says here, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day I set foot in Asia, that's Asia Minor, modern-day modern Turkey. I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears, <clears throat> with trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. So Paul was severely persecuted by his own people. And he says, verse 20, and verse 27 is a reflection of, of, uh, of verse 20. And Paul says, I, how I did not shrink from declaring to you. I did not shy away. I did not, was not hesitant from declaring or proclaiming or preaching to you anything that was profitable in teaching you publicly. So Paul would teach uh, publicly, sometimes in the open square, sometimes uh, in, on Sunday mornings when they would have services in people's homes because they didn't have churches established, church building established at that time. They would need to uh, in different houses, and Paul continues, says, and from house to house, an indication that they, the services, the church services were held in people's homes, um, and where they would also have uh, Bible studies. Verse 21, here he mentions the uh, object of his preaching, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord, so, and Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Paul, Paul was committed to use the Word of God to see people transformed by the, God, the gospel. That's what the Word of God is for, to preach the gospel, to share the gospel of truth, so that people will come to repentance and come to saving faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 22, And now behold, bound by the Spirit, so in other words, the Holy Spirit is, has, has bound him, basically tell him, go to Jerusalem, he says, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that chains and afflictions await me. Paul was in prison many times. He was, when, when, when he was in prison, he didn't have there a bed and a TV and so forth. No, he was in chains, uh, probably most, most cases. And uh, <clears throat> so saying that chains and afflictions await me, and Paul continues, but I do not make my life of any account, nor dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the, of the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I sent, I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Paul was saying to them, We're going to, I'm going to see you in heaven. Uh, you won't see my face uh, on earth uh, anymore but I'm going to see you in heaven. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood uh, of all. 
uh, verse 27 on screen. For I did not shrink, I did not hesitate, I did not, was not shy to declare, to preach, to proclaim to you the whole, here in this translation says, the whole purpose of God. Now, I'm used to the uh, uh, King James, New King James, and other translations says the whole counsel of God. Uh, I think the NESB says the will of God. Which one is true? Well, all three are true. Because it, we see that Paul was not hesitant, uh, was not shrinking from preaching and declaring the whole purpose of God, to reveal the purposes of God, to reveal the counsel of God, what is in God's uh, a revealed counsel, and also his will. Verse 28, he continues, he says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, he's speaking to the elders there, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased from his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among uh, your own selves men will arise speaking uh, perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Thus, here is one passage where we see Paul clearly elevating all of Scripture to its rightful place. He says all of Scripture is God's revealed will. I'll expand on that very, very shortly. It's God's revealed will, all of it. All of Scripture is his counsel. And all of Scripture is where we see his purposes are made clear and plain to us. His purposes, his will, his counsel. This was what is what Paul was committed to do in his work of church planting, and as one who was a pastor for all those churches, he was committed to teach and preach the whole counsel of God. And in elevating the Word of God, he was also preaching the gospel of free grace, the gospel of grace, that salvation is only possible through Christ and his finished work of the cross. What is the outcome? Well, we see that in verse 20 and 21. Paul says, how I did not shrink from declaring to you, preaching to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly from house to house, in verse 21, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks about repentance, teaching them repentance is the key to come to faith in Christ, repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Not just repentance, but faith in Christ. Because salvation is not about just believing uh, that things are true. Even the devil believes the Bible, that it's all true. The devil believes that the Bible is true, the gospel is true. He believes all that. And a lot of people think they're Christians simply because they agree that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. But, but faith in Christ is key. That is placing our faith, our personal trust in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on the cross that is the hallmark, or what truly believing is. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Placing your life, repentance, and placing your trust and faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Therefore, the purpose of the Word of God, the Word of God is also known as the revealed will of God. A lot of Christians are wondering, Lord, what's your will for my life? They never read the Bible. Uh, Christians are trying to figure out, oh, what's, the, what's my purpose? What's my, uh, what is the Lord counseling me to do? What am I supposed to do as a Christian? What's your will for me? Well, read the Bible. Read it from, from, uh, from back to, 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 to the front. Uh, did I say that right? From, from, from back to front to back, whatever. <laughs> uh, read the whole thing, Genesis, Revelation, then read it again, read it again, read it again. And then attend Bible studies so that we can understand the, the, what, what the verses are intended, uh, what it means and how it applies to us. Then you will know, and God will help you and give you wisdom as to what you should do in your life. God, you know, a lot of Christians are looking for a sign, you know, you know a sign to, to drop it right in front of them. Do this. <laughs> Don't expect that. Read the Word of God, and God expects us to use our minds and our discernment to develop wisdom so that we can make wise decisions for ourselves. So the Word of God is God's revealed will to us. It is uh, for God, uh, the Word of God is uh, where God reveals himself to us. Imagine that. God revealed himself to, to Abraham in person. God revealed himself to, to Moses in person. And 
You know, how does God reveal himself to us? Through his word. We will get to know him, who, who he is, through his word. Read the word of God. Plus, also, the word of God has this purpose. Uh, what if I hold a mirror in front of you? Then you see what you look like, right? Every morning, I get up, I go to the bathroom, and I look in the mirror. And I, I'm either horrified or overjoyed. <laughs> One or the other. But in most cases, I'm not overjoyed. That's all. I've got, I've got to comb my hair. I've got to wash my hair. I've got to shave and so forth. So the, the, the mirror is, does not lie, right? It tells you exactly who you are. And that's what the Word of God does. When people read the Word of God, they put it aside or they throw it away and say, I don't like what it says. Because it reveals you as a sinner. Guilty before God. So that's what the Word, the word of God does. It has the power to reveal ourselves uh, regarding who we are before God himself. And thus God's word has the purpose of revealing how bankrupt we are and then to lead us to Christ to be saved by him. Not only does the word of God reveal to us that we're sinners, but it also says, here's the way. You see yourself as a sinner? Here's the way of escape. Christ, the cross. Go to the cross, go to Christ, and God will wash you from your sins. That's the power and the beauty of of the Word of God and of the Gospel. So here I'm going to read some quotes from the book itself because uh, I'm going to give Mark Dever the credit because he says a lot of things that are good. So he says, uh, the first mark of a healthy church is expositional preaching. That's his conviction. It's also mine. It is not only the first mark, it is far and away the most important of them, of all the nine marks. If you get, because if you get, if you get this one right, all of the other marks should follow. That makes sense, right? Because if we handle the scriptures correctly, properly, accurately, then we are able to get all the other eight marks uh, in, in, you know, um, more correctly. <laughs> so, so that's why expository preaching or teaching is very important for us. Because that way we leave, again, no stone unturned. I keep saying that. I've said that many years, for many years. That's my, my, my conviction, to leave no stone unturned. And so when you teach or preach by exposition, you leave no stone unturned. Because we come upon a verse of Scripture, oh, I don't like that, and we skip it over. If you preach and talk all the time, you can choose, oh, God, I'm not going to preach on this section because I don't like what it says. Well, I don't have a choice. You know, we're called upon to preach the whole counsel of God, and I'm committed to do that until the Lord takes me away. So we are to preach and teach the whole counsel of God uh, until Christ returns. Another quote, But if you establish the priority of the word, then you have in place the single most important aspect of the church's life, and growing health is virtually assured. And that's, that's good. That's true. So it is... It's not like a you know, guarantee, guarantee that you know, you're going to have a healthy church, but it means that we're going to move in that direction. When we are committed to understanding that uh, by exposition, exposition of the Word of God, we're going to move in the direction of greater health. And that should happen when Christians together are committed to do that. Because God has decided to act by His Spirit through His Word. And that's a very good point. Because God has decided... That he's going to operate uh, and act by his Holy Spirit through his word. Why? Who wrote the scriptures? The Holy Spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit wrote the word of God. And so God has chosen to use, God the Spirit has chosen to use the Holy Spirit to operate in and through us. All believers have the Holy Spirit. And so when I read the scriptures, I rejoice what I see there. And the Lord will use his word as he sees as he, as he fit. Another quote. What is most important? What is most important in real estate? Any real estate agents? Real estate agents here? <laughs> uh, what is most important in real estate is most important in understanding the Bible. Location, location, location. You understand a text of Scripture where it is. Where is the verse of Scripture found? <clears throat> you understand it in the context in which it was inspired. I heard this... Uh, story years ago as a younger Christian, and I shared this a few times at our church. This is a, I believe it's a fictitious story. Here was a Christian, a young Christian, trying to find the will of God. Lord, uh, show me the way. What should I do? 
Um, and uh, wh where should I go? What am I supposed to be as a Christian? And so the, the, this one Christian was used to uh, open the Bible at random and put his finger on a verse of Scripture and read it, and, and by, by that way determining what's the will of God for him or her. Well, let's say it's a him at this point. So again, it's a fictitious story. <clears throat> so uh, he read the verse, uh, Judas went out and hanged himself. Oh, so <laughs> surely that can't be true. Uh, Lord, is this what you want uh, for me? Uh, so he tried again. He found another verse of scripture. It says, uh, it's in Luke 10, 37, you go and do likewise. <laughs> so there he was <laughs> quite shocked again. And he tried, tried it a third time in John 13, 27. Again, this is only a portion of that verse. Um, and uh, where it says, what you are going to do, do it quickly. <laughs> so you can see the problem that when we take verses out of context. Mm -hmm. I, I heard, I read many years ago that a text out of context is a pretext. Mm -hmm. And we can take a verse of scripture and make it say whatever we want. So we have to, to uh, understand a verse in its context, which means the verses, especially the verses before, when it says, we see the word therefore, ask yourself, why is this therefore, therefore? <laughs> it's because of what was, what was being referred to before. So look at the verses before, look at it, understand it in the context, then go back to your verse and say, oh, now I understand what it means. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, another quote, when someone uh, regularly preaches in a way that is not expositional, the sermons tend to be only on the topics that interest the preacher. And it's true. I visited many churches when I was down south, and where the preacher oftentimes just picks a topic, and uh, you know, and it's it's what he likes, it's what he wants. And they'll they have a little, uh, you know, a hobby horse or something. They have a little, uh, oh, they want they like to pick on this topic, and they're always talking about a certain topic. Well, the result is that the preacher and the congregation only hear in scripture what they already thought before they came to the text. There's nothing new being added to their understanding. There's not uh, there's not continuing uh, to be uh, challenged. They're not, right? they're not continuing to be challenged by, by the Bible. So there's a, there's a danger in just preaching topically all the time because, again, for those reasons. So I'd like to close by showing the power of the Word of God and its effect on dead sinners, which is what uh, the author in this book, he referred to Ezekiel 37, and decided to, I'm going to do is I'm going to also uh, do something very similar to what he has done. If we turn to Ezekiel 37, and this is the Valley of Dry Bones. And I, and I love that passage. I never really preached on it, but this morning is the closest I've ever done to, to actually uh, to preach the text. Ezekiel 37, verse 1 to verse 6. And in doing this, we're going to see how it's important for us to look at a passage in context and how the Old Testament uh, and the New Testament are connected to it together because we see Christ making reference to what we see in Ezekiel 36. So Ezekiel 37 says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out, of, out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. So the Holy Spirit was breathing upon Ezekiel, and God was speaking to him by the Holy Spirit. So it says in the, in the saw vision, it was a valley full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, that's a reference to uh, Ezekiel's humanity, and can these bones live? And uh, I think Ezekiel was playing it safe. He says, Oh Lord God, you know, <laughs> you know. Um, then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, Oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. That's amazing, isn't it? Where God says, uh, Hear. <laughs> God is speaking to the dry bones, and he's saying to the bones, listen to the word of God. Uh, verse, four, verse 5, it says here, and, and uh, thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath, that's very interesting here, cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And uh, I will uh, lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover uh, you with skin and put breath in you. Keep that in mind. Breath in you and you shall live. 
and you shall know that I am the Lord. This is a powerful illustration given to us to reveal to us how God, how his word and the spirit of God and the power of the gospel, the power of the cross work together to bring dead sinners to life. It is God who breathes upon us, who breathes upon us and gives life. So here we are, uh, we are described as dry bones. We are dry bones before we have come to faith in Christ. In Ephesians 2, 1, it says that we are dead in trespasses and sins. We are spiritually dead. We're dry bones. There's no life in us. There's no flesh upon us. There's nothing within us. And so we are described as dry bones with no life and no possibility of life left to ourselves. Can you see, you know, uh, bones in a, in a grave uh, by itself uh, come back to life? Now look at Lazarus, who was dead for four days. He was there. His body was starting to, to decay, and there was a smell. And so here Jesus spoke um, to Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Here we see the breath of God, the word of God, the, the word of Christ himself, Christ breathing upon the body of Lazarus, and he came back to life. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of God bringing us to the saving faith. And I'll expand on that in a minute. So again here, verse, verse 5, I love, love this verse. Thus says the Lord God to these dry bones, Behold, I will cause. Who is causing those dry bones to come back to life? It's God. God, he says himself. Not man. I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. That's the breath of God who breathes upon us. In the Hebrew, the word for breath is the word ruach. I'm not sure I pronounce it correctly, but that same word can either be translated as wind. We see the word wind in the Old Testament. You see it's, it's actually the word ruach. And the word breath is also the word ruach. I'll try to say that five times fast. <clears throat> and also, it can also be the word spirit. That is a human spirit. It's also a reference to the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit. In Psalm 51, Jesus, uh, uh, David says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. It's the same word. So we see the same word, ruach, is... Uh, described here either to be breath, wind, spirit, or Holy Spirit. And so this takes us to the previous chapter in chapter 36. Turn to chapter 36. So this is an example of expositional teaching and preaching as we look at the passages in context. So what God was referring to in Ezekiel 36, it's also connected to, to chapter 36, verse 24 to 27, where God here, uh, not sure if is, uh, Israel, they were already in the land of Babylon, but this is that whole context where they were in the land of Babylon and God promises to bring them back to Israel. Verse 24, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. Keep that in mind, the word water here. And you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. Verse 20, 26. And I will give you a new heart a new, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Before we come to know Christ, we have a heart of stone. We are dead. We're like the dry bones with no life. And God says he will take that heart of, uh, of, of stone and he will transform it into a heart of flesh that is alive and finally verse 27 I will put my spirit upon you this connects us with chapter 37 where God says I will breathe upon I will cause the uh, breath to enter you onto the dry bones and this is the same thing I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules uh, take the time to read Ezekiel 36 and 37 in your own time just to, to, to confirm all these things. So here the author of Mark Dever, he says the following, God told Ezekiel to speak to the dry bones. Life came through breath. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, traveled through speech, and that word of God, his breath, gave life. Do you see the close connection between life, breath, spirit, speech, and word? It's closely connected. You can't separate them. This brings us to the New Testament. Where we're almost done. John chapter 3. John 3, 3 to verse 8. A portion of scripture that I refer to a lot. 
Jesus said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again. I remember hearing that for the first time as a non-Christian. I thought, well, what is this all about? <laughs> but it's, it's in the Bible. Born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then verse 5, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water. Remember we mentioned water in Ezekiel 36? Water and the Spirit. Spirit and water are one and the same. Water is the work and activity of the Holy Spirit who washes us and cleanses us. It's not a reference to baptism. As many are trying to say, that's an example of eisegesis, where people are saying, oh, the water uh, here is referring to baptism. No, it's not. Look at the context, and look at the context of the Holy Scripture. The water is a reference to the Holy Spirit, that he washes us and he cleanses us. Um, and he says he cannot enter the kingdom of, of God. Uh, verse 8, the wind, again, wind blows where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. We see how Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 36, and John chapter 3 are all connected to each other. It's important to understand uh, that ex expository preaching and, and study of the Word of God is very important for us to gain a broad and a broader understanding of Scripture. So then, the Word, when studied, taught, and preached, expositionally gives us a full orbed or a well-rounded message of the gospel of saving grace. The word of God is that instrument, the means whereby God creates faith in us to believe. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God or the word of Christ. Final uh, quote, I believe, or a few more quotes I'm almost done. Uh, Mark Dever says, we need God's word to be saved. We need that. You see how it is through the word of God that anybody is saved. But we also need it to continually challenge and shape us. This is speaking of our sanctification. His word not only gives us life, it gives us direction as it keeps molding and shaping us in the image of God who is speaking to us. So we see how the word of God is instrumental in shaping us into the likeness of Christ that is our sanctification. I'm just going to skip this one portion. Um, and so, another quote from uh, Mark Dever. He says, asked about his accomplishments of, as a reformer, Martin Luther said, Martin Luther said, I simply taught, preached, wrote God's word. In other words, he translated the Bible into the German language. He says, otherwise, I did nothing. <laughs> the word did it all. And so he, what he said is absolutely true. The word does it all. I, you know, I can try and convince someone until I'm blue in the face, or until they're blue in the face, you know, in anger toward me, but it is the Spirit of God who takes His Word and who does that work of, of, of convicting and of convincing and of drawing to Christ. Uh, final quote from Mark Dever, If you're looking for a good church, the role of the preacher of God's Word is the most important thing to consider. I don't care how friendly you think the church members are. I don't care... Uh, how good do you think music is? Uh, those things can change, but the congregation's commitment to the certainty of the word coming from the, pulp, from the front, from the preacher, the one specially gifted by God and called to that ministry is the most important thing you can look for in the church. Um, let's say amen to that. Thus, the challenge is before us. The goal of every Christian ought to be to read the scriptures very carefully in context it takes years of discipline for the believer, the teacher, the preacher, to rightly handle the Word of God. And we see in uh, Paul's exhortation to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.15, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, he says, rightly handling the Word of Truth. That applies for me, it applies to every Christian that we rightly handle the word of truth. May the Lord help us to move in that direction. Much more can be said. I forget what next week's uh, um, mark is, but uh, you'll find out next week if you come. <laughs> Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, uh, we have much to learn. I have much to learn. Thank you, Lord, that through the course of years, you have helped me to uh, handle the word of God better and better. But Lord, I, I know I still have much to learn. So now, Lord, we pray, uh, and I pray for everyone here, that we, you would help us to handle the Word of God correctly and, uh, and to be uh, pleasing in your sight. 
uh, bless uh, everyone here, bless those who may not know Christ yet, and as these words we, we saw in Ezekiel 36 and 37 and John chapter 3, may these words speak powerfully to those who may not know you. We pray in Christ's holy name. Amen.